Thank you so much, Ricardo, for a fascinating presentation. So I now open the floor to interventions. So go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about the competition, I suppose, between scientific knowledge and experiential knowledge, yeah. or at least the tension between them, and which one you would accord a greater privilege if they are in conflict or how you would how do you resolve that whole thing i'm not sure i know that from well the you so the assumption is that not everybody can so let's say the, the um, departure is open science right that is uh, uh, all researchers produce data these data are available they are available in the repositories of their universities or uh, on the, of the foundations. So they are, they are available, but they must be read. In order to read them, you need uh, to publish them in a scientific paper. The scientific paper still is too uh, scientific, let's say. So in order to have the data available to, to the people that reason on this by means of experiential knowledge, you have to, do, to go some steps further. So you have to, to have the results of the paper put into a handbook. The handbook becomes something which is talked about in the newspapers, and eventually you might have a television show on this. At, at this point, which is the highest level of, of, of communication. At this point, uh, the people of the experiential group are aware of the thing, and, and they can interact. Um, what is wrong is to say the scientists that uh, work on the data have no reference whatsoever to the people uh, the people so the, the people that govern so i'm really making this this romantic idea of of the, of the glass walled rooms in which the group convenes and, and connects other people and they talk on issues and, and they produce something which is exactly what commissioner Moedas calls open innovation so open innovation is there is open science uh, we have agreed that uh, the companies that deliver the print that deliver the service are um, say uh, open to uh, receive inputs from from the groups so these people do open innovation but uh, these people do open innovation as far as uh, their preparation and education get them so it, 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 it's a question of communication Right. So if I'm a climate scientist and I publish a paper that shows that sea levels are rising and I then sit down in a room with people who say, no, it isn't because yeah. I walk on the beach every morning and I know the sea isn't coming up, then what happens? Yeah, well, it happens that um, uh, these people must, must get together with... Uh, other people that eventually come uh, to a, a platonic dialogue, they were saying Aristike, that eventually convinces them that uh, the climate is actually changing. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So the scientist uses a demonstration. Demonstration is a scientific uh, truth, uh, and which is well, well verifiable and, and, and things. Uh, the people that work on endoxa, on accepted opinion, they don't need truth. They need to be persuaded. Yes. President Zamagni. Or, uh, or after her. After Jane. Jane. Right. Please. I was just thinking, Ricardo, putting together what you were saying with what Max did immediately before the yeah. break, where he talked about level two and the activism. Um, so he had a picture of, of medics lying down to protest uh, climate change but there would also be Stevens climate scientist so to what extent is the kind of platonic dialogue is that the ideal or to what extent do you think that at times of crisis that there can be more direct action and more activism or do you think that the academic must stay at Max's level zero or level one Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it was a bit off putting. I remember I, I once had a, an appointment with the Secretary General of the Minister of the Environment. And I asked the appointment because I was putting together a multi agency project on migration. Migration. So I show up and say, Well, we, CNR, we're doing this on migration. And he says, 
my boy, <laughs> sorry, a bit paternal, my boy, what is you and your group doing towards uh, uh, reducing climate uh, uh, rains? And said, well, <laughs> we do what we can, obviously. Uh, we think that working on migration helps too. Ah, yes, good. So you are thinking in the right direction. So <laughs> it, it was a bit of putting, but um, we, um, so when, when things get hard, uh, uh, results are there. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Minister Katabia can endorse or, or, or not endorse what I'm saying, but um, we had a very lively, we had a set of very lively discussions in Italy as regards uh, policies for vaccination. Uh, many experts were around, perhaps too many experts were around, but, uh, but the response of the people was reflective. It was not uh, denial. It was it was reflected. So, what we think we should do, and obviously uh, they didn't go into libraries and 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 set together groups the way I have been discussing it. We keep that for 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 less uh, urgent uh, approaches. But um, uh, let's say um, the, the COVID pandemic has uh, brought forward uh, very many issues that were only embryonal. In, in the science and for society paradigm, because the science and society paradigm uh, was uh, uh, constructed along six keys, namely science education. We, we talked about that, science, science literacy, science education, public engagement, this is what I've been talking about, um, uh, open science, open science, governance, governance, and, 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 and gender, uh, the, the role that women play in this. And um, um, it's, so it's changed because uh, suddenly everything was important. Uh, so the, the preparedness that was uh, decided by the government had to be implemented and, and people had to become ready to accept. Uh, that is a spiral that went on in Italy these, day, these months. But I must say, we are satisfied, are we not? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. Three specific questions. Does your work has um, any connection with the commons-based peer production model by Bankler? You never heard Bankler. Can you get the name? Commons-based based. peer production. No, sorry. But Joachim Bankler. No, no, it's an American. Anyway, uh, you talk about a participatory society. Don't you believe that uh, we need uh, to qualify that? Because everybody today, everybody talks about participatory society. If you talk to a populist, populist leaders, they say, we want a participatory society. We go to the squares, we talk to them, we allow. So don't you think that in the beginning, that notion was clear enough? to define a specific entity. But nowadays, that concept has been taken by virtually everybody. For instance, uh, if you, we stick to a liberal democratic model of democracy, liberal democracy, a participatory is redundant because by definition, a democratic setup has to be participatory. The, the point is that how do you think that a true meaning of participatory can be implemented? Third and final, you talk about uh, readiness, which I like it. Don't you believe that in order to be specific and to make the notion of readiness implementable, we need uh, to refer to the principle of subsidiarity? Because without subsidiarity, readiness will never be achieved. That is a point which is too often forgotten. Yes. Now, Professor Cartabia, hmm. <laughs> she knows, because one of her last uh, sentence before she left uh, the presidency of the Italian Constitutional Court, sentence number 131 of last year, exactly deals with this uh, point, how to make uh, subsidiarity, not a vague concept, but something concrete. Because otherwise, how do you think that readiness in the sense that you have explained can be implemented? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I, I start from the last, from the last question and I start with a classical remark. Um, 
in the Republic of Plato, uh, Transimachus says uh, justice is the is is law of the strongest, and Plato and um, uh, Socrates said justice is the is, is is good, what is good. And uh, you cannot uh, do evil if you know what is good. So first you have to know what is good, and then you, you, we are safe. And so I, I, I assume that looking for the truth, looking for the good is something we can all unite with. And the Holy Father is saying exactly this. Um, but as regards uh, um, participation too much, uh, my answer is um, I start from content. I'm not talking about participation, whatever. I'm talking about content. And the content I'm talking about is culture. And culture is in libraries, museums, and science centers. So the argument I'm making is uh, uh, citizens ought to, to uh, appropriate content, common content, common goods, works, uh, paintings, squares. And uh, they ought to experience the content firsthand. And they, they ought to share these experiences, creating inclusion. So um, the whole pro program of uh, definition of cultural innovation is uh, fine. We have digital ways of reproducing content. Uh, we have content available. It's easier to, to access content. It's easy to share. But the result is, is inclusion. That is, uh, we, we, we want to, to uh, show that this experience brings to something close, and, and culture plays a role. And, and for this reason, we are arguing that uh, uh, culture, cultural heritage ought to be a priority of uh, um, European policies. Thanks. Max. Thank you. Just thinking about your exchange with Professor Lewandowski and thinking about your commitment to dialogue, I suppose what Professor Lewandowski may have been hinting at is that sometimes you're just going to run up against people who are just literally going to deny. It makes me think about uh, Carrie Norgard's work, sociologist who had broken it down in three ways. One is literal denial. Second is uh, interpretive denial, where we just interpret things differently. Thirdly, I think where most of us live is implicatory denial, but by implication, we choose not to take on that information. And I think in that literal space of denial that it sounds like you were getting at, do you have creative strategies in order to, to continue to make that progress instead of, you know, just running up against someone who just yes, says, it, no, it's no. It's not me who is working on these strategies. It's, a, it's a, the people that run, for instance, science centers. Uh, um, let's say Deutsches Museum in Munich, uh, Copernicus in, in Warsaw, uh, 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 what's the name in, in London? So, um, and, and these are uh, big centers with enormous programs for outreach to self-excluded groups. So they are trying to, to get to the deniers. And, and uh, they are working on that. Obviously, I, I, I don't, I'm a philosopher, I don't go that far. Um, but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a substantial problem. How do you reach out to people that uh, negate it? And, and, uh, and some, some successes are, are, are achieved. I remember Minister Heitor in Portugal had a very successful network of uh, science centers all over um, this, uh, districts in, in Portugal, in all provinces. And there was a, a, a very substantial response, we can say, also because at that time we had the so-called smart specialization strategies uh, that were regional and were thought to boost uh, excellences in practices, and again, communities of practices at the regional level, the provincial level. Evora, uh, Porto, uh, it, it, it was successful in certain sense. So I, I'm building on that. But uh, I, I'm launching the, the paradigm of, of cultural innovation to show how groups can ac access uh, common goods and, and, and create some processes. Obviously, uh, self excluded groups are, 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 are hard to get, but uh, sooner or later, you should not give up. Thank you.
Thank you, Ricardo. I just want uh, perhaps to stress one point you have made about um, the role of uh, libraries and museums in order to foster more reflective societies and more critical societies. I have a small experience in my own university since we uh, built the Museum of Art and with its theater and everything, a lot of activities have been going on and the students have been involved in that. And the, the experience of music, art and everything has fostered a reflection in many ways. And so it's a very small experience, but it, it's true that it makes an impact. And the same is going on with the Museum of Sciences, that uh, the, the activities that it, that it, that it is promoting. Um, my, my take on this is that you can foster reflectivity in society through these means, but then uh, there is also uh, other places in society where you can find a lot of knowledge, which is professional practice. Mm -hmm. And to me, there is still a challenge, uh, which is um, creating these reflective uh, processes between academy and society, you know, to, to make professional practice uh, more reflective of its own knowledge <coughs> and to, um, uh, yes, enrich, uh, research, academic research with that knowledge. So that kind of circularity uh, should, should, should be something in order, and, and I think that we all could benefit in, for our topic, which is uh, combating post-truth. You, you know, realizing how much truth there is implicit in professional practice is practical truth, is technical truth, but it can be, you know, um, a, yeah, assume it at, a, at a higher level, it can be more reflective, it can make you conscious. Yeah, that's well, it. Yes, and I, I, I like uh, the hint you're giving me for telling you the story of a, a, a successful initiative of the Popular Party in the European Parliament. It was uh, <coughs> Patrizia Toya, the president of ITRE, the Commission of Innovation and, uh, and Economy. Um, Christian Ehler of the German Democratic Party, and Silvia Costa, who is a, a famous uh, um, Roman um, rep representative. And they managed to um, provide a viable alternative to the discussion on the common routes. The common routes in the preamble uh, was a botched uh, initiative uh, around the year 2000. Uh, they started working on this at the end of 2010 in preparation of 2014, and they came up with the idea of the reflective society. It was, it was very, very, a reflective society is not anarchic, it is, is, is not um, subversive, it's constructive. And it is constructive because we know we are looking at common good. So it, 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 that's, a, that's a beautiful story. Uh, too bad, uh, I wrote an article on, on the Solo 24 Hour on this. Too bad the, the reflective societies have gone. <laughs> is, they have disappeared from Horizon Europe. And, uh, and uh, too bad, because uh, it, it was a tribute to, to what we are doing here in this, in this seat at SSA. Great, thank you, Ricardo. That's all the time we have for this um, presentation. Thank you.